Namaste and welcome to Daily News Simplified, the what, why and how of newspaper reading. Now we would be analyzing the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper of 15th of February 2019 and the news that would be covered today is given on the screen and the timestamp for the same is given in the description and the comment section given below. And so now with this, let us start with the first article. Now we have taken this article from page 13. Now as all of you might remember that during demonetization, rupees 500 and rupees 1000 notes were taken out of circulation. Now what this article is trying to highlight is that the number of currency notes which are in circulation as of now have actually increased beyond what was the number of notes which were in circulation before demonetization happened. And it is within that context that the author is highlighting various facts with regards to the current cash which is in circulation in the Indian economy. Now you should see this article from the perspective of GS Paper 3 within the section Economic Development and within the subsection Issues Related to Indian Economy. Now the main facts which has been highlighted by this article is that the currency which was in circulation before demonetization happened was around 18 lakh crore. And according to the article, the number of currency which is in circulation as of now has now gone up to around 20 lakh crore. However, according to the article, the estimate of currency which should have been circulation by March of 2019 should have been around 22 lakh crore. However, what has happened is that the current status is only around 20 lakh crore. And what the article is trying to highlight is that the currency in circulation is still short of at least 1.5 lakh crore. Now, these are the main facts which have been highlighted in the article that the currency in circulation before demonetization was roughly around 18 lakh crore and the current status of the currency in circulation is around 20 lakh crore. However, what the article is trying to highlight is that the estimated currency in circulation that should have been there for March of 2019 was 22 lakh crore and therefore according to the article, the shortage in the estimated growth in the currency in circulation is around 1.5 lakh crore. And it is on this basis that the article has highlighted two reasons as to why there is a shortage in the estimated growth. Now the first reason given is that the informal activities which mainly use and rely on currency for exchange have not shown the required growth. Now as we already understand that the Indian economy generally is focused upon informal activities and for these informal activities cash is basically used for exchange. Whereby let's say informal activities such as a person who is working in a bank or an IT company or any other formal activity then this person may be paid through bank drafts, check, NFT and other forms of formal payment systems. However in informal activities the main form of exchange is cash itself and this is mainly seen in the informal activities such as in the construction sector whereby the workers who work in the construction sector are paid in cash. Agricultural labourers which work in the rural economy are also paid in cash and therefore most of the economic activities which happen in India are generally informal activities which mainly use cash as a medium of exchange. And what the article is trying to highlight is that this informal activities has not shown the required economic growth whereby if there had been more informal activities within the Indian economy then more cash would have been used and therefore more currency would have been in circulation. However, what is being seen is that there is a shortage in the estimated growth in the currency in circulation. And what the article is trying to highlight is that this means that less cash is being used as a medium of exchange for informal activities. And what this further could mean is that the economic growth in informal activities is not high. Now the second reason which has been highlighted in the article is that the currency of higher denominations such as rupees 2000 note is not getting adequately circulated within the Indian economy, especially within the large states. Now what had happened after demonetization is that the rupees 500 and the rupees 1000 note were taken out of circulation and after that the government of India introduced the rupees 2000 note and it was after the introduction of the rupees 2000 note that new rupees 500 and new rupees 1000 notes were introduced in the Indian economy. So let's say before demonetization, if four people were using the rupees 500 notes, it means that there were more banknotes which were in circulation. However, after demonetization, the rupees 2000 notes first started to be used. However, what this means is that only one banknote was then being used as a currency in circulation, as compared to the four banknotes which were earlier used as being in circulation. And what the article is trying to highlight is that prior to demonetization, if more 500 rupees notes were there in the Indian economy, 
they were being much more circulated within the Indian economy. However, with the introduction of the rupees 2000 note, it is not being adequately circulated within the Indian economy. And apart from this, in informal activities, it is generally the lower denomination notes such as the rupees 100 and the rupees 500 which are used for circulation. And what is being seen is that the rupees 2000 note is not being adequately used within the informal activities as a medium of exchange. And an example of this is let's say a person who's working as an agricultural labourer within the rural economy might be paid rupees 500 per day. And therefore the person who's paying this agricultural labourer and the agricultural labourer himself would not require the rupees 2000 note. And therefore what is currently being seen is that in the informal activities whether in the rural economy or the urban economy the rupees 2000 note is not being widely used. And this has led to the inadequate circulation of the rupees 2000 note in the Indian economy. And therefore these two have become the main reasons as to why there is a shortage in the estimated growth in the currency in circulation. Now the article has highlighted two speculative impacts that can be understood from the shortage in the estimated growth in the currency in circulation. Now the first speculated impact which the article is highlighting is that the increase in currency in circulation after demonetization cannot be taken as a proxy of economic activity. Now what the article is trying to highlight is that the government of India has said that because the number of currency which was in circulation before demonetization has been recirculated in the Indian economy, it means that there has been economic growth within the Indian economy. And what the article is trying to highlight is that just because the number of currency notes which existed before demonetization has now come back into circulation, it does not mean that it has led to economic growth. Whereby if demonetization had not happened, then the Indian economy would have had around 22 lakh crore currency in circulation. However, what is currently being seen is that the currency in circulation is around 20 lakh crore. And thereby what this means is that the economic growth within the Indian economy has actually gone down. And just because the currencies in circulation has increased after demonetization, it does not mean that it has led to economic growth within the Indian economy. The second reason given in the article is that the shortage in the estimated growth within the currency in circulation means that there has been a decline in the informal economy. Now this is a point which I have already understood whereby according to the article there has been a shortage in the estimated growth in the currency in circulation of around 1.5 lakh crore. And what this means is that there has been a decline in the usage of cash within the informal activities. And therefore according to the article itself this decline in the currency in circulation growth can be taken to mean that there has been a decline in the growth in the informal economy. Now these are the main crux of this article and hopefully you've understood them from the perspective of GS Paper 3 within the section Economic Development. And so now with this, let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken this editorial from page 9. Now what this editorial talks about is that it provides three main indexes. The first being the World Happiness Index, the second being the Social Hostilities Index and the third being the Global Peace Index. And what this article is trying to highlight is that India is ranked among the bottom in all of these three indexes. However, you have to understand that this editorial in itself is political in nature. And therefore what we'll do is understand about all of these three indexes from the perspective of your upcoming prelims examination of 2019. Now in the Daily News Simplified of 8th of February, we had already discussed the various questions that have been asked in previous prelims examination on various reports and indexes. And what you can do is refer to that video to understand on how questions have been asked in previous prelims examination on various indexes. However, with regards to today's article, the first index that we are going to understand is about the World Happiness Index. Now we are going to understand information about all the three indexes based on three parameters. First, who has given out that particular index? Whether the World Happiness Index is given out by the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. The second aspect that you need to understand is the purpose of that particular index. Whether the World Happiness Index provides the state of global happiness. And what is unique in the 2018 report is that it also provides for the happiness of the immigrants that come to a particular country. And the third and the final aspect that you need to understand about any form of index is the various parameters which have been used. Now the World Happiness Index primarily uses data from the Gallup World Poll. And this Gallup World Poll basically uses the Central Ladder Survey. 
Now, what the Central Ladder Survey means is that it provides a range from 0 to 10, whereby if you're happy, you give a score of 10, and if you're unhappy, you give a score of 0. And therefore, if you're asked to give your perspective in the World Happiness Index, then the Gallup World Report would ask you based on the Central Ladder Survey, whereby it would ask you to rate your happiness based on a range from 0 to 10. And you could give 10 if you're extremely happy, and you could give 0 if you're extremely unhappy. Now the second index that the editorial talks about is the Social Hostilities Index. Now this index is given out by the Pew Research Center. And this index is provided in the annual report by the Pew Research Center known as the Global Restrictions on Religion Report. And it is in this report that the Pew Research Center provides two indexes, first being the Government Restriction Index and the second being the Social Hostilities Index. Now, the purpose of the Government Restriction Index is to measure the government restrictions on free practice of religion. While the Social Hostilities Index looks at the various forms of violence between groups around the issue of religion. Now, the main parameters under which the Social Hostilities Index is measured is that it includes crimes which are motivated by religious hatred. Now, these crimes could include mob violence, crimes against women due to religion, and various other indicators which highlight crimes which have been done due to the issue of religion. Now, the third and the final index which has been highlighted in the editorial is the Global Peace Index. Now, this Global Peace Index has been given out by the Institute for Economics and Peace, which is a private think tank in Australia. And the main purpose of the Global Peace Index is that it provides strengths in the global peacefulness. And apart from this, it also provides the economic value if peace is maintained. And the third and the final aspect that you need to know about the Global Peace Index is its parameters, whereby it measures global peacefulness on three domains. The first being the level of safety in the society, the extent of ongoing domestic and international conflict that a country is involved in, and the last aspect is the degree of militarization within that country. Now you need to understand that these are the main facts that you need to remember about the World Happiness Index, the Social Hostilities Index and the Global Peace Index from the perspective of your upcoming prelims examination of 2019. And therefore now with this, let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken the first article from page 1 and this article further continues on page 10. Now what this article talks about is that nearly half of India's waste to energy plants are currently not being used. Now, what is required to be understood from this article is why is the waste to energy plants in India currently not operational? And after that, we'll try to understand as to what are the possible solutions that can be undertaken so as to make the waste to energy plants within India operational. Now, you have to understand this article from the perspective of GS Paper 3, first within the aspect economic development and second within the aspect environment, whereby within economic development, it should be seen from the perspective of infrastructure especially within the section energy and with regards to environment it should be seen from the perspective of environmental pollution and degradation. So now let us understand as to why the waste to energy plants within India are not being operational. Now there are three main reasons as to why waste to energy plants within India have become defunct and the first reason is of the environmental concerns that are there with regards to waste to energy plants. Now what generally happens in a waste to energy plant is that municipal waste is taken to a waste to energy plant and in this waste to energy plant this waste is then burned and through the burning of this waste energy is then produced. Now this energy which has been produced by burning municipal waste in waste to energy plants is then used to create electricity. Now what is happening in India is that the municipal waste which is going to waste to energy plants contain large presence of chlorinated hydrocarbons such as PVC. Now what happens is that when these PVC pipes or other similar or other similar types of plastic are burned in these waste to energy plants, they release a number of harmful compounds such as dioxins, mercury vapors, furans and lead compounds. And apart from this, what also happens is that in waste to energy plants within India, about 30% of the residue meaning what is left over after the waste has been burned, includes bottom ash and fly ash. Now if you take a look at both of these images, the first image provides as to what are called PVC pipes. Now what is generally happening within India is that the municipal waste which is collected contains a lot of products which are made from chlorinated hydrocarbons such as PVC pipes. And when these chlorinated hydrocarbons are burned, they release a number of dioxins, mercury vapor, furans and lead compounds. And apart from this, if you take a look at the second image, 
after this municipal waste has been burnt within India, it leaves over about 30% residue in the form of bottom ash and fly ash. And this can be seen in image number 2. Now both of these aspects have raised environmental concerns with regards to waste to energy plants. Now the second reason as to why waste to energy plants within India are becoming defunct is because of the low energy production viability in the municipal waste. Now what is being seen in India is that the municipal waste has very high biodegradable or what is called wet waste content. Now an example of wet waste would be organic waste. Whereby what is happening within India is that the municipal waste contains a lot of waste which are leftovers from vegetable, fruits and other highly biodegradable waste. And apart from this, the waste from vegetables, fruits etc are also wet in nature. And thereby what is happening is that to burn this organic waste, a large amount of energy is then required. And what increases the problem within India is that the municipal waste within India contains about 60 to 70 percent highly biodegradable waste, which is much higher as compared to 30 percent biodegradable waste, which is the available within the West. And because of this, the municipal waste, which is then used in waste to energy plants within India, have a very high moisture content. And because they have a very high moisture content, they require a large amount of energy to burn. And the energy that is then produced by burning such high moisture content waste also produces very low energy because of its low calorific value. Now in simple terms, when we say calorific value, it means the heat that has been produced by complete combustion of a particular weight of a product. And because Indian municipal waste contains largely biodegradable wet waste, they have a very low calorific value, whereby the heat which is produced by burning them is quite low. Apart from this, what is also happening within India is that the municipal waste within India is not segregated. Whereby what happens in the West is that the organic waste is kept in a separate bin, the paper waste in a separate bin, the plastic waste, glass waste, metal waste and other aspects of waste are segregated at the source. Whereby what happens in a Western household is that if they have produced some form of organic waste, they would put it in a separate bin. And similarly, if they have produced plastic waste, they would put it in a separate bin. Now, these separate bins are then taken by the municipal corporation. Whereby the organic waste is used in a separate plant, the plastic waste is used in a separate plant. And similarly, the glass waste, the metal waste are used in separate plants for recycling. And what this means is that the waste within the western countries is being segregated at source. However, what is happening in India is that a normal household generally puts all of their waste in one particular bin and this one particular bin is then collected by the municipal corporation and this complete waste which also contains metals, plastic, paper, organic waste is then provided to the waste to energy plants and at these waste to energy plants, this waste then cannot be segregated. And therefore what is missing within India is source segregation which is a practice followed within the western countries. So if India were to also follow source segregation then the plastic waste especially the PVC would then be segregated at source and it would not lead to environmental concerns for waste to energy plants. And similarly if the organic waste or the wet waste is also segregated at source then it would not be sent to the waste to energy plants whereby it would reduce their current 70% presence within Indian municipal waste. Now apart from this, if you again take a look at the text, municipal waste within India also have high inert content. Now when we say inert content, it basically means examples such as concrete, clay, tiles etc. which when burned do not produce any form of energy. And again, one of the main reasons as to why we have such high inert content within the municipal waste within India is because there is no form of source segregation. Now because of both of these reasons, waste to energy plants within India have low energy production viability, whereby the amount of waste which they are burning produces low amount of energy. And what this means is that waste to energy plants within India have low efficiency. And thereby what this does is that it makes the waste to energy plants within India expensive to operate. And apart from this, if such energy is then used to produce electricity, it becomes too high of a cost as compared to other forms of electricity generation. Whereby because of all of these reasons, the electricity produced in waste to energy plants is more expensive as compared to electricity produced from solar power. Now the third and the final reason as to why waste to energy plants are becoming defunct within India is because the waste to energy plants within the western countries are being phased out. 
and that reason the waste to energy plants are being phased out in western countries is because there has been high instances of cancer which has been seen in people who live near these waste to energy plants and similarly what has happened in india is that there have been protests within urban areas against the formation of these waste to energy plants whereby one of these protests has happened within delhi itself whereby residents of a particular locality within delhi have been protesting against the formation of a waste to energy plant seeing the results from the waste to energy plants that were set up in western countries now these are the three main reasons as to why waste to energy plants within india are becoming defunct now let us understand the various solutions which are possible for effective operations of waste to energy plants within india now there are four possible solutions which can be undertaken within india so as to prevent the waste to energy plants from becoming defunct now the first possible solution is that the niti aayog has proposed to set up a waste to energy corporation of india and this waste to energy corporation of india would construct waste to energy plants through the ppp model where what would happen is that to decrease the cost of forming the waste to energy plants and improving the efficiency in costing of waste to energy plants within india the government can partner with private companies under the ppp model and this corporation can be overseen by the waste to energy corporation of india the second possible solution has been given under the solid waste management rules of 2016 whereby under the solid waste management rules of 2016 it had provided that pvc should be phased out in the usage in waste to energy power plants and this phasing out of pvc should have been done by april of 2018 however what has happened in india is that the solid waste management rules of 2016 have not been effectively implemented whereby what is currently happening is that it is very difficult to identify and remove pvc from the mixed municipal waste whereby what is being expected is that pvc should be removed at the waste to energy plant itself however since most of the municipal waste which have been brought to waste to energy plants contains organic waste glass plastic pvc and other forms of waste and thereby it becomes very difficult to first identify pvc and then remove pvc from this mixed waste and therefore what is being required within india is to have source segregation whereby pvc should not be thrown out in municipal waste The third possible solution is that the National Green Tribunal has directed the Ministry of Environment to phase out single use short PVC and the NGT had asked the Ministry of Environment to issue directions for phasing out of single use PVC by July of 2017 however what is currently happening within India is that the single use short life PVC continues to be used within India and be thrown out in municipal waste How an effective solution so as to prevent waste to energy plants becoming defunct within India is to phase out single use short life PVC as has been directed by the National Green Tribunal. Now the fourth and the last possible solution so as to prevent waste to energy plants becoming defunct is in simple terms source segregation. Whereby most of the problems which we have discussed with regards to waste to energy plants such as the presence of PVC organic waste and other aspects can all be solved by using source segregation whereby as individuals or as households or as companies it is required within india that we segregate our waste whereby recycled waste in forms of plastic glass metal and other aspects should be thrown in separate bins while organic waste which can be used for compost in agriculture should now also be thrown in separate waste and rest of the waste which can be used in waste to energy plant such as solid waste should then be segregated in an another manner So now hopefully up till here you've understood as to what are the problems with waste to energy plants and what are the possible solutions so as to prevent the waste to energy plants becoming defunct within India. Now question for your practice for your mains examination is what are the primary reasons for the ineffectiveness of waste to energy plants to reduce waste and produce competitive electricity within India. Suggest remedies for the problems that are therefore mentioned whereby you would be able to answer this question with the help of the explanation given in this section. And so now with this let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken this opinion based editorial from page 9. Now this article is a continuation on the recent articles which have appeared in the Hindu newspaper on unemployment. And what this article provides are three perspective as to whether the unemployment crisis within India is for real. Now what we're going to do is understand this article from two perspective. First the reason as to why the unemployment crisis within India is real and secondly the reasons as to why this unemployment crisis within India is being over emphasized now you should see the article from the perspective of gs paper 3 within the section economic development 
and within the subsection Indian economies and issues relating to employment. So now let us understand the first aspect as to the reasons given in the article that the unemployment crisis within India is real. Now the main argument which has been given as to show that there has been an unemployment problem within India is of the recently leaked Periodic Labour Force Survey of the NSSO. Now what this report has shown is that the unemployment rate in India is standing at 6.1% which is the highest for the last 45 years. Apart from this, the Periodic Labour Force Survey has also shown that the labour force participation rate, meaning the individuals who are capable of working and are also participating in work, has declined from being at 56% in 2011 and 12 to roughly around 50% in 2017 and 18. And according to the article, this has shown that half of the India's working age population is not part of the labour force. Now what this means is that under the labour force participation rate, age from 16 to 64 is seen as the working age population. And what the periodic labour force survey has shown that only 50% of the individuals who are within this age group are currently working. And what this means is that 50% of the population who are currently in the age group who can work within India are currently not participating in the labour force. Now the main argument given in the article to show that there is an unemployment problem within India is of the leaked periodic labour force survey report of the NSSO. However, the leaked report has been criticised is that the methodology which has been used by the periodic labour force survey is currently flawed. Whereby what has been said is that the number of people who have participated in the survey is too small. And secondly, the survey has given more weightage to states with large populations such as UP and Bihar. Whereby according to the article, most of the jobs are being created in large states such as the southern states like Tamil Nadu, Kerala and apart from states like Maharashtra and Gujarat. Apart from this, what the article is also highlighting is that more number of former jobs are being created in urban areas. However, what is happening with the periodic labour force survey is that it has given lesser weightage to big cities. So the main argument which has been given in the editorial as to why there is no unemployment problem within India is that the editorial has showcased that there is a problem with the methodology of the periodic labour force survey. Now this is the only aspect that you need to understand with regards to the question asked in the editorial. Is the unemployment problem within India real? Whereby both the supporting and the against argument for this question mainly focus upon the periodic labour force survey. And what you need to understand is that the periodic labour force survey has still not been released by the government of India. And the aspects which have been highlighted in this editorial with regards to the periodic labour force survey is mainly focused upon the observations which have been given in the leaked report by the business standard. And it is therefore best to wait for the periodic labour force survey report to be officially released by the government of India to understand the unemployment problem within India itself. Now the article has also highlighted various other problems with regards to unemployment or underemployment within India. Wherein the first actual problem with regards to employment in India is that India has potential to achieve high economic growth by reaping its demographic dividend, whereby what is currently being seen in India is that the individuals, let's say from the age of 16 to 64, which has been taken in the periodic labour force survey, currently form the highest percentage within the population of India. And why this is a good thing is that because most majority of the population is of the working population and the dependent population, meaning people who are below the age of 15 or senior citizens who are above the age of 64, currently from the minority within the population. And this means that there are more people working and providing for the Indian economy than those who are dependent on individuals who are working. And what has been seen is that when countries go through a demographic dividend, they have high economic growth. And this has been seen in the United States, European countries, Japan, China, and is now currently being seen in India. However, the problem with this demographic dividend is that if there is a failure to provide jobs or quality jobs to such individuals who are entering the labour force market, it would adversely affect the Indian economy in generational terms. Whereby the next demographic dividend which India is going to see would be much centuries later on. And therefore it becomes highly dependent that the current demographic dividend which India is going through should be taken complete advantage of. The second problem which has been highlighted is that according to a report published by a think tank known as CMIE or the Centre for Monitoring Indian Economy, there has been a decline in the jobs because there has been a decrease in the investment proposals within the Indian economy. Now in simple terms, it means that there are less companies which are setting up bases or new manufacturing plants within India. 
and this means that there are fewer new jobs being created within the Indian economy. And therefore, one of the actual problems with regards to unemployment within India is of the decline in the private investment. Whereby, if there is an increase in the private investment within the Indian economy, it would lead to increase in the number of new jobs that are being created. Now, the third and the final problem which has been highlighted in the article with regards to unemployment within India is that majority of the jobs that are being currently formed in the Indian economy tend to be informal. And apart from this, these informal jobs are also low-paying and also do not have access to social security benefits. Whereby the economic survey of 2016-17 has shown that only 35% of the jobs that have been created in India are in the formal sector. And therefore what is required in India is the creation of more formal sector jobs as compared to informal sector jobs. Whereby the formal sector jobs are also considered high paying and also have access to better social security benefits such as healthcare, pension and other forms of social security benefits. Now these are the three main problems which have been highlighted in the editorial with regards to problem of unemployment within India. And so now with this, let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken this article from page 7. Now what this article highlights are various observations of an expert panel on the national minimum wage. Now what we are going to understand from this article are the main observations which have been given by this expert panel committee. Now what has happened is that the Dr. Anup Satpati committee has submitted a report on determining the methodology for fixing the national minimum wage to the Ministry of Labour and Employment. Whereby what this committee does is provide a need-based substance level minimum wage which should be provided to a wage earner. Whereby this minimum wage should be enough to support the family irrespective of their skills, occupations and sector. Now what currently happens in India is that each state provides its own minimum basic wage. So for an example, Delhi may have a minimum wage of Rs 21,000 while Bihar may have a minimum wage of Rs 17,000. And apart from this, what also happens is that this minimum wage is also specified based on skills. Whereby a highly skilled person, meaning a person who has a college degree, may have a minimum wage of Rs 21,000 while a semi-skilled person who has attended school may have a minimum wage of let's say 16,000 while a low-skilled worker may have a minimum wage of Rs 14,000. And this is a condition in many states whereby the minimum wage is divided upon the skill the person possesses. And what the Dr. Anoop committee does is that it suggests a substance level minimum wage. Whereby if to live in Delhi you need rupees 31,000 so as to provide proper food, education, health and other aspects to your family then this should be the minimum wage. Whereby any person who is employing you within Delhi should pay you this minimum as your wage. Now you need to understand that the figures being given in this explanation are speculative in nature and are only meant to be used as an example. Now the first recommendation that this committee has given is that it has suggested a different national minimum wage for different geographical regions of the country whereby this national minimum wage should be according to the local socio-economic realities and the labour market whereby the cost of living in a city such as Mumbai is very expensive. And therefore the minimum wage which should be paid in the city of Mumbai should be more as compared to other geographical regions within India. Apart from this, it has also been seen that the labour market in cities such as Bangalore, Chennai and other major cities is very competitive. And therefore the minimum wage which should be provided in very competitive labour market should also be high. The second main recommendation given in the report is that it has introduced a city compensatory allowance. Whereby what the Dr. Anoop committee has done is that it has recommended an additional house rent provision which should be given to urban workers and this minimum compensatory allowance should be in addition to the national minimum wage. So let's say if to live in Delhi you have been given a minimum wage of Rs 21,000 then according to the committee there should be an HRA allowance that should also be provided. Whereby let's say if it costs Rs 10,000 to live in a city like Delhi or if Rs 8,000 to live in a city like Nagpur then each city should be given a compensatory allowance based on the local conditions of house rent within that city. The third main observation which has been given in this report is that the Dr. Anoop committee has recommended that the minimum wage should allow a particular person to consume 2400 calories per day which includes 550 grams of protein and 30 grams of fat. So let's say if to consume 2400 calories plus 50 grams of protein and 30 grams of fat, you require rupees 100 within the city of Delhi per day then Rs 100 should be the starting minimum wage in a city like Delhi and the minimum wage for Delhi cannot be less than Rs 100. 
Now, the fourth and the last observation, which has been given in the Dr. Anoop Committee report, is that the basic minimum wage should be at least in line with the consumer price index. And if there is an increase in the consumer price index, then the minimum wage should also go up. So let's say if in a city like Delhi, I'm able to consume 2400 calories, 50 grams of protein and 30 grams of fat at rupees 100 per day. However, now what has happened is that it is taking me rupees 150 to consume the same products. And according to the Dr. Anoop committee report, the basic minimum wage should then be increased based on the increase in the consumer price index. So let's say if the consumer price index has increased by 3%, then the minimum wage should also be increased by 3%. However, the report does not mention if that there is a decrease in the consumer price index. Whereby, let's say if there is an increase of 3% in the consumer price index, then the minimum wage should increase to rupees 103 from rupees 100. However, let's say in the next six months there is a decrease of 3% within the consumer price index, then should this minimum wage should also be decreased. And it is within this context that you have to understand that this news is in transition. Whereby we'll have to wait and see as to how the Ministry of Labour and Employment reacts to the committee report on determining the methodology for fixing the national minimum wage. And what is required for you to remember from your prelims examination point of view is that the Dr. Anup Satpate committee is related to determining the methodology for fixing the national minimum wage and has been provided under the Ministry of Labour and Employment. While the four main observations that have been given in this report can be highlighted if a question is asked in your mains examination with regards to national minimum wage. And so now with this, let us move on to the next section. Now there are two questions for your practice and the first question reads, which of the following would enhance India's ability to harness the demographic dividend? When the first statement states, increase in share of dependency population upon working population, the second statement states, augmenting public and private investment in services and industrial sector, and the third statement states, increased distribution of farm income among members of a household. While question number two reads, consider the following statements, wherein the first statement reads, the national minimum wage for India is provided by Ministry of Labour and Employment. The second statement reads, minimum wage is intended for same beneficiaries as universal basic income. Which of the statements given above is a correct? And what you need to do is pause this video, solve both of these questions and wait for five seconds for the correct answer. Now the correct answer to question number one is C2 only. Whereby India's ability to harness the demographic dividend can be increased by augmenting the public and private investment in services and industrial sector. Whereby increasing the public and private investment in the Indian economy, it would create more new jobs. However, with regards to statement number one, increase in share of dependency population upon working population will not increase India's ability to harness the demographic dividend. Whereby under demographic dividend, it is the number of working population who should be more than the number of dependency population. While with regards to statement number three, increased distribution of farm income among members of a household is a form of disguised employment. And therefore, disguised employment is not a mean to harness the demographic dividend. While with regards to question number two, the correct answer is D, neither one nor two. Whereby India does not have a national minimum wage. And if India does not have a national minimum wage, then it cannot be provided by the Ministry of Labour and Employment. While with regards to statement number two, minimum wage is not intended for the same beneficiaries as universal basic income, whereby the universal basic income is provided to everyone, while minimum wage is only provided to wage earners. Whereby let's say if you and me are not working, then we would still be paid a universal basic income, but we will not be paid a minimum wage. And therefore, the correct answer to question number two is D, neither one nor two. Now, there are two more questions for your practice, whereby question three reads, which of the following statements are correct about World Happiness Index? When the first statement reads, it is provided by the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. The second statement reads, the report primarily uses data from the Gallup World Poll. And the third statement reads, it is inspired by the Gross National Happiness Index, which has been developed by Bhutan. Whereby question 4 reads, which of the statements correctly describes currency in circulation? Whereby the first statement reads, it includes notes in circulation, rupee coins and small coins with public and with banks. The second statement reads, it only includes notes in circulation with the public. The third statement reads, it includes notes and coins released from vaults of banks. And the fourth statement reads, it means the notes and coins provided by RBI and government of India to public and to banks. 
And as you already understand, what you need to do is pause this video, solve both of these questions and wait for 5 seconds for the correct answer. Now the correct answer to question number 3 is D, 1, 2 and 3, whereby the, all the three statements are correct. And with regards to statement number 3, you have to understand that the World Happiness Index is inspired by the Gross National Happiness Index, which has been developed by Bhutan. While with regards to question number 4, the correct answer is A, that currency in circulation includes notes in circulation, rupee coins and small coins with both the public and with banks. And you have to understand that when we say rupee coins and small coins, it means rupees 10 coin, rupees 5 coin and the rupees 2 coin. And now with this, we come to an end in the analysis of today's newspaper. Now we move on to the question for today.